Today is March 31st, 2019. My name is Quinn Phelan, and I'm interviewing Mark Escamilla for the Voces Oral History Project. We're sitting in Corpus Christi, Texas. Dr. Escamilla, thank you for sharing your perspective with us. As we have already explained, your interview will be housed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection. Please know that if there is anything you don't want to talk about, you don't have to. And if there is anything you do want to talk about that I don't ask, please feel free to interject. All right, let's get started. So, can you say what your job is right now? I'm president at Delmore College here in Corpus Christi. Excellent. And how aware were you about the lawsuit, LULAC versus Richards, or the South Texas Border Initiative? So, I was a resident, actually an undergraduate student um, here in Corpus Christi at the time. And I paid, I read the papers, time there was no social media or anything so the amount of information coming was limited through either the news or the newspaper uh, television news and so forth so I would say I was fairly I watched it closely because I was looking for alternatives as a student as an undergraduate to uh, um, to, uh, to experience myself looking for advanced degrees and opportunities so I would say I was fairly fairly abreast of what was going on why do you think the inequity between schools of higher education in Texas was allowed to exist? I think it's, knowing what I know now, after six legislative sessions, I think it's very quick, uh, very easily, in my mind, it's very easily to understand it as a, as a power situation, representation at the Capitol, I think dictates and drives everything. And I think the representation at the time however strong it was for our area, relatively speaking to our area, um, was not uh, fully articulated and adopted at the state level. What was it like for you growing up in South Texas, just kind of in general? It was, uh, it was a wonderful experience. I loved it. I still love it. That's why I moved back home ten and a half years ago. Um, I love the culture having roots from Mexico and being part of the original land grants going back to the 1700s here in, Corpus, in, in this region of South Texas. Um, I have deep, deep roots here, multiple generations. And uh, it was just a wonderful place to grow up. Uh, the beach, the salt water, the, the outdoors, fishing and ranch life and all that. Um, it was just, it was perfect for me. Um, so how did the educational opportunities in the Coastal Bend compare to other places in Texas you've seen? Recently? I mean, is it currently or back then? Back then, Back yeah, then. Oh, so, well, I studied it and, um, as a student in the late 80s, coming out of high school, um, 87 to be specific. Um, I saw that there was, I mean, there was limited ch choices. And that's what that's because it and then I felt it affecting me, and I always wondered. That's what made me curious about the whole thing. And so, locally here in Corpus Christi, um, you had the choice if you're going to start your lower division instruction, uh, you started at Del Mar College, or you went to Texas A and I in Kingsville. That was the four-year university here at the university of now A&M Corpus Christi, was Corpus Christi State University back then, was only two years upper division. Oh, so you couldn't start here. So you couldn't start here. So it was a two plus two. And I did it perfectly. I did 60 hours at Del Mar College, 64 hours at A&M uh, Corpus Christi State University. Got a Bachelor of Science with 124 degrees as, as required on the dot. And so, um, it was either that or go to Kingsville. Well, my dad had some businesses, so he had these small businesses and stuff, so we, that was our means of tuition and everything else. I borrowed virtually no money. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that later. I only borrowed a little bit of money one time to, to graduate my senior year. <clears throat> and so, you know, dad wrote checks. You know, that was my pay. Living expenses at home, a little bit of fishing money a little bit of social money, that kind of thing, and uh, um, tuition, books. Do you remember back when you were going to school, did um, 
Texas A&M Corpus Christi at the time. Um, it was Corpus Christi State University. Yes. Did they offer doctoral programs? There was one. There was one. Do you know what it was? It's an educational leadership program that they split with Kingsville. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so it was like one cohort that they put together. And I found that amazing because I looked at it. You know, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but yeah, the one. Yeah. Going back really briefly, just to growing up, to give some context to the rest of this, um, were you allowed to speak Spanish in school? Was it ever um, discouraged or talked about? So, I remember from, excuse me, these allergies are getting me. So I remember from an early, to early age, I went into, from, a, from an elementary school, I can speak about experiences all throughout. I was part of the first gifted and talented program, uh, the first year of, of uh, the program here at Windsor Park, in, here in Corpus Christi. I was selected out of uh, my neighborhood community, uh, my neighborhood uh, elementary school. And I remember landing in second grade at Windsor Park. And I felt it. It was a different world. It wasn't a neighborhood based. It was a magnet program for gifted and talented kids. Um, I, w I would argue to this day that the fit for me was not there. Well, I think it was evident as I didn't continue after sixth grade. But, but when I was there, culturally, I knew I did not belong. I had isms, I had sayings, I had, I had parents that spoke to me, I had grandparents who only spoke Spanish, and, and I wasn't the only one by any means, but I knew that I lived in a different world and I came from a different solar system um, from, from my experience at that school. Don't get me wrong, I have lifelong friends and I'm so proud to have been a part of the, for the years, but uh, it was uh, culturally not a fit for me. Um, were there any other Hispanics in the Gifted and Talented program? Absolutely, and I know them to this day. And I will say that it had probably more to do with a combination of the culture and socioeconomics. Um, because there was a group of us that we all come from. We all came from the other side of town because we rode the bus together. We just, uh, we, knowing what I know now, we were all part of that same echelon, if you will. And we all struggled. And where there was a, looking back, because I've done my own qualitative research, I've done my own analyses, uh, informal albeit, um, I think the common denominators were low SES, relatively low SES, and the Hispanic culture. What that, is SES? Social economic status. Oh. So, um, that combination of group, I remember we struggled, and I can, I can name them right now, I won't, but I can name them. There was a, a small group of us, we struggled. Did you, did you notice that other kids your age that weren't part of that program, didn't go to that school from your original neighborhood, did they talk to you about that experience? Did they say anything about you going to a Oh yes, school? absolutely. Well, why do you go to that school? Oh, you go to school for the smart kids. You go to school over there with the rich kids. Anything out of our own neighborhood, and you were rich, right? <laughs> we had no idea what rich was. Rich was just different, I think. Uh, I would say that. Yeah, so sure. I, uh, I was, you know, my little neighborhood kids were like, why don't you ride our bus? You know, why don't you walk to school with us? And, uh, but I was treated differently. And I remember the, one of the instances in second grade, when you have that cultural gap, and you have those those language barriers and so forth, um, even in English, uh, those cultural barriers were very evident. I always talk about this. I am, my wife would say cursed, I say blessed with the memory that says, uh, that brings every detail of my life with me, much to my wife's lament. But I remember instances where, as I look back, I can analyze what they were. And for instance, I remember in second grade, getting sent to the office because I didn't, because I was being stubborn with the teacher. She came in, and she's the sweetest lady too. She just didn't know me, it was new. She, we had our, we had our, <clears throat> our belongings on our desk. 
And she says, put your belongings away. I didn't know what that word meant. I'm like, I never heard the word. That's not the way I was spoken to. I didn't, I, I, and everybody was moving and everybody had different things on their desk. And I was looking for something that started with the B on my, on my desk. And they're saying, put those away. And I stood there and I froze because I, I was a good kid. I didn't get in trouble until a little bit later. But I remember that day and she got mad at me. And she yelled at me, you better put your stuff away. And I froze and I just froze because I was afraid. She got mad at me and pulled me out of that chair and grabbed me by my, shot, my arm and get out of here and go to the, doc, the principal's office. I was like, I got in trouble. You know, I was like, gosh, I just got here. You know, I was like, and the teacher, and the, I remember the principal asking me, saying, uh, why didn't you put your belongings away? I said, I don't have any, I don't know what, I think they kind of figured it out after the fact. That's <laughs> after I got in trouble and <laughs> got pulled out of class. But uh, anyway, things like that, constantly. Because I mean, they would say things, I didn't know what they were speaking, they were speaking a different language. We spoke Spanish and English back home. And uh, um, even our English was just very, very different, you know? And uh, here was this big educational social experiment to start, you know, its first gifted and talented program of its kind in Corpus Christi and big deal, all this other stuff. And of course they were trying to you know, make their numbers, do all the, you know, do all that they can to support that initiative. And it's still going very strong to this day. But those are the kinds of things that happened a lot, a lot. And I remember as a kid, I would, even as a second grader, uh, and then up to the sixth grade level, I would look for the, for the uh, teachers who spoke Spanish, or who had Spanish surnames, rather. And uh, I would just naturally just glom onto them. I mean, because I didn't know what was going on as a kid. But I knew that they understood me, and they did. And it was, there was a, there was a familiarity there, but there were so few. There was one or two or three. I think there was three throughout my whole time there that I had access to. And I remember them to this day. I still know one of them. That's good. That's a lot good. of years. Like a role model or something. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. So. Um, did it get better as you went along? No. No. You <laughs> it's got worse. Oh, my home didn't change. My home, uh, you know. Uh, you know, he became older, and in our house, we were very traditional, um, in, our, in this case, a very traditional Hispanic family with its own business. You, you work for the family, you work for the business, you contributed. As a very young person, my dad brought us into a world of work, okay? I mean, I was a little kid picking up trash on construction sites, um, eventually opened this other business, and we worked there too, and so we grew up fast. And I was in this adult world at a very young age, and I was always around. And so, as a result, um, well, my reality was different than my kid, my my, my counterparts, my 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 fellow students. They they got to go play on weekends or do nothing. I never got to do any, you know, just do nothing. Sundays was the day to go to church, go to the beach, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and even then with the construction world, a lot of seven day a week. So a lot of weekends we work as a young kid. So that really shaped me, polarized, I, polarized me from education, frankly. Polarized me from any normalcy. I didn't have a normal upbringing in that regard. And so it was different. So how did you view education in kind of your early formative years? Did you? Did Resented that? it the whole way. Yeah, resented it the whole way. It was where, <clears throat> now when I went to junior high, when I went to my, when I got, when I left that program, those are the best years of my life, I would say, of, of school, a public school, because I went to school with kids like me. And we all had the same background in junior high level. So did those early experiences in the Italian Gifted, uh, did they lead or impact your career path later in life? I would say absolutely. It, 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 I, I have no, I mean, I, I, I live without regrets as a general rule. Just accept what was, try to turn it into a positive. First of all, I still have those lifelong re relationships with so many of those students. And yes, as I made that ultimate decision to move into education, um, 
Yeah, it had a, it had a strong influence. It, it gave me, it told me that the world was trying to tell me something about myself, that I had more capabilities than, uh, than my own expectations and probably even the expectations of my own family. You know, everybody knew I could work hard. That was, that was the badge of honor. That was the great badge of honor. You, do you have a work ethic? Um, as a young, young person, we worked very young, did all kinds of things. And we were, we, and so that was the, the big badge of honor. Um, and so what this told me was I, not only could I work hard and cared enough about working, um, but that I also had some intellectual capabilities that some other folks saw in me. So that's what, that's really what it, it reinforced. It told me it's just, again, culturally, there just wasn't that fit. Yeah. So you moved to middle school and you were back kind of with people more like you. Oh, yeah. And then same for high school as well. No. Oh. No, in high school, in high school, I lived right on the border from my neighborhood high school. And we actually went to school, which was the newer high school at the time. And relatively speaking. And there, there was a strong resentment of being Mexican, okay, that's those were the terms back then. You, you didn't come, in my junior high, we were all proud of our, all, our you know, there's very few Anglos, very few African Americans, very few Asians, and I mean, I'm gonna say like 90 plus percent Hispanic. Okay, it might have been 85, but it's not, you know, significantly more. So there you could be yourself, and there it was, the culture was embraced, everybody at least spoke the, the neighborhood lingo, everybody spoke the familiar, the, the familiar lingo, and we were all of this. There was not a rich kid, what I would call a rich kid today, or excuse me, a rich family, I should say, or a wealthy family to this day. There was not one in our junior high. There were some that were solidly middle class, but not, I would say, not one upper class, upper socioeconomically positioned family. Okay, when I went to high school, much bigger, lots of wealth, relatively speaking, um, lots of wealth. And that drove uh, the, the direction of the high school, it drove the culture. Um, had I gone to my neighborhood high school, um, I think it would have been the same situation. I think relative wealth of these two high schools were very little to significant amounts, relatively speaking. So it sounds like those schools were a little bit like segregated. Huh? Um, like there was cer certainly not an appreciation for the culture. and It was, you know, I got there, I was mocked. I would say things. Uh, I would, uh, well, I... Grew up where I grew up, and, and yes, I had ties from elementary school with some of the folks. Um, of course, high school was only 10th, 11th, and 12th back then. Junior high was 7th, 8th, and 9th, so um, when I got there, it was, it, was, it was really difficult to fit in. If it wasn't for sports, I think I would have done something else. Well, I, don't know, I don't know if I'd have finished, really. I, even, I really resented the whole three years I was there. A little bit of fun the senior year, but because uh, of sports. Football was my love. And uh, that's what kept me going. And how did you feel with the rest of the, like, the football team? Were you comfortable with them? They, they made fun of me, and I fixed it on the football field. <laughs> Practice field especially. I loved it. That, that was my absolute joy. They know it to this day. They know it to this day. They'll tell me, oh, man. <laughs> and and, I, and uh, so there was a different world, and uh, we came from different worlds. They made, I had all kinds of funny nicknames and so forth. And, they'd make fun of me and you know because I would but then we got to be like a, a little I guess to use that term out that the band a little band of brothers from different worlds and so forth and I would bring them to the west side and I'd take them all to the good places to eat and then they'd go and they'd come to my dad's shop out on the west side eventually as we all started driving I'd fix their car their trucks and put really snazzy muffler systems you know do, do all kinds of stuff like that you know trick out their trucks and stuff and so they got to know who I was. So by my senior year, it got a lot better, but it wasn't a place, it was a place that you did not embrace your culture. It was a place that resented it. 
and um, they made it very well known. And so it was difficult for me. And so I just just went with the flow. Do you feel like you were able to hang on to your culture though, even though? Oh yes, I would never let go. Yeah, yeah, they could all. <clears throat> go somewhere special as far as, as far as I was care anybody who kind of was any but but I had some teachers I had some teachers that were they were they were pretty uh, sharp about things and critical about things and, you know they were they fell into that culture too and look this is just the, the, the late 80s and so there's still much carryover from I'm not saying it's gone to this day because I know it's not, but um, there's still a lot of carryover from earlier uh, generations, shall we say. So it was different. Um, did I fit? Yeah, I found a way to fit, um, but I resented it the whole way. So after high school, uh, what did you do? Did you go straight to Del Mar? I went straight to Del Mar College. Um, I was encouraged to find jobs and so forth, and but I said I want to go to college. I said, look, I can. Even my own family was like, critical piece in history right there was a big oil bust. And so dad lost his oil company, I mean, lost his uh, um, construction company, sold out. Had a lot of difficulty with the, with the federal government, IRS, and so forth. And so that's what I thought I was going to do. That's what I wanted to do. And so the encouragement was no. And then we had this other shop. We had the auto shop and the muffler shop and so forth. And, um, the, the deal was, you're not going to work here. This is just to get you through. Go to college, find something to do, and get out of here. That was that's that was the message, because the economy was so bad at the time. And uh, so I went to Del Mar College. Uh, had a miserable first year and summer. Two summer, let me see, summer, fall, spring, summer, miserable. Why is that? Had no idea what I really wanted to do. If you grow up resenting school to the day you graduate high school, and then all of a sudden you jump into a college class, you're like, oh gosh, what am I doing here? So I had, you know, I didn't flunk everything. I was smart enough to drop everything except one class. Um, the only class I passed my first year and a half was college algebra. So I knew I could do math and stuff and whatever. Um, but, uh, so it took me about a year and a half to just dabble in and go in and find stuff and, and work and continue to work in the family business and so forth. But your parents were uh, encourage, encouraging of going to school? It, it was, it was a, yes, it, it wasn't a, you're going to go. Um, it was make the best of what you have, figure it out, and so forth. Yeah, I was talking about this the other day. Uh, I was accepted to then Southwest Texas State University, Texas State today, my, 1988, I think. My family wouldn't let me go. Like, well, I mean, they said, okay, well, you can go, but see you later. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I got accepted. I've got a vehicle. It's not worth a whole lot, but it could probably get me there and back, you know, a few times a year. I'm sure there's financial aid. They said, no. You're not going. And I was just like, okay. I said, you can work here and you can do this. This is our formula. Or you go figure it out yourself. And then I said, well, because I did love it here. You know, There's no resentment from my family other than that decision probably at the time. I said, there's no salt water in San Marcos anyway. I love fishing and surfing here, going to the beach and stuff, so. That was easy. It was, I was like, all right, fine, whatever. Resentful, probably for a semester. Got over it and moved on. And that was when you were going to Del Mar? Mm hmm Because, mm -hmm. again, I didn't want to go to Kingsville. I had no connection with Kingsville uh, at the time. And, uh, yeah, I could have... Whatever. It's just th those are my opportunities there. So then once you finished at Del Mar, how did you decide to uh, go to... Christi. Again, same model, same calculus. Stay home, you get to eat, you get to live, you get to, you know, we'll pay your vehicle, and that kind of thing. So it was uh, um, very much a, just a, probably a path of least resistance and a way to get through and check the box. Of course, what happened was when I was in Del Mar, the English department really inspired me. It 
did both. They, I really struggled at the beginning, and then I found that I got to be pretty good at it. I ended up in both British and American lit, and I was like, wow, this is cool. The British poets, who had ever thought that I was over reading the British poets at my dad's muffler shop? You know, I'd be studying, reading Keats and Browning and all these other things, and I was like, wow, how fascinating is this? And I only ended up in those classes because I registered late and I needed some classes to finish school. So I wasn't an aspiring uh, poet or anything like that by any means. It was default, but the English department saved my life. It helped me figure that out. And I tell my faculty that at the college today, they just roll their eyes. Yeah, right. You're just trying to... Anyway, I've worked with several English departments. They're very... Suspect of presidents, let's just say, and administrators. That's their nature. Um, I say that lovingly. Again, they saved my life as a student and uh, found a track. I actually went into criminal justice because it was a sociological kind of study of what I saw a lot of. And so I found a groove and then I took off and came here to, a or to Corpus Christi State University because they had the other two years. So by the time you got to Corpus, were you, did you have a positive, more positive feeling? Oh gosh, yes. Well, the fact, the simple fact that I was able to go to university, and I had status amongst my friends and at home, and they're like, oh, okay, good. You get to go to university and work at the muffler shop. Good for you. You know, my brother did that before me. And so that day, I think it was 93, I think that he graduated from here. And that was like one of the most inspiring days of my life. And my family all went to his graduation, and I showed up late by myself, and I had to sit in the back. But I sat there, and I was so proud of my brother to see him walk across the stage. Just absolutely inspiring. I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the same thing. No doubt in my mind, no matter what it cost. And, of course, he's been a teacher for 30-something years. And, um, and I did the same thing. Finished. And then went back. So what did you get your bachelor's and master's in? Or, yeah, your bachelor's. No, bachelor's in 92 in criminal justice. Mm -hmm. I specialized in corrections, and that kind of sociological aspect. And then uh, 95, I got my master's in counseling here. Because again, it was the only thing that was really offered. There was so few offerings. Uh, there was not a criminal justice back, uh, master's. There still isn't, but I don't think there is. Um, there's so limited, limited offerings that the offers are just Tiny. Well, you figure there's 3,000 students back then at the university. is 12,000 now, so there's scale to give you. Yeah. Um, so how did you end up uh, looking into education? How'd you get out? So this is my favorite part. Um, when I was at Dad's shop, um, as I struggled and succeeded in college, um, I would share with the customers. Because they were all my people, my people from my neighborhoods, and you know, you had that business for thirty something years, so you had you knew a lot of people. And my dad would often I would talk to customers, and they'd say, well, "What are you doing?" I said, "Well, I'm going to school, and I'm working here." Well, how do I get into college? You know, they asked me, and I'd light up. I would light up. I would just sit there and say. Well, this is how you get through Del Mar. I can tell you that, and I can tell you this, and I can do those kinds of things. And so my dad would, I remember my dad would sit there and say, hey, stop what you're doing. I'm like, what? Stop what I'm doing. Stop working. Okay. Come talk to so-and-so. Their son needs help. Their daughter needs help. They need help. Tell them what you did. Tell them where to go. And so I would do this like academic advising on a regular basis. They're at the shop. And, um, and I loved it. I got this charge out of it. I didn't realize what was going on. Again, I didn't, wasn't doing it to become a, an aspiring community college president. This is purely accidental, uh, purely fate, if you want to say it that, if you look at it that way. But I was not planning to do that. I just got this charge in helping people to prepare. And so I always remembered that. But then I forgot it for a while. You know, I moved on. I was going to go be a federal agent. That's what I want her to do. Yeah, I'm guessing, I mean, there's a little bit of irony of that you were not a big fan of your education in earlier years, but then you became an educator. So I guess you weren't exactly, um, 
you weren't thinking that you wanted to do education. It just no. ended up being something that no. you liked the part of Purely stumbled into it. Just purely happenstance. It's just... So then you did your work as, after college you did, what was your first job? So, um, I was a drug counselor. Uh, I did the federal caseload for the local drug abuse council, so I'd do all the federal parolees and prisoners, or not prisoners, uh, par parolees and probationers. Those who had addiction problems, I would, I'd handle the federal caseload for a little while, and then I did um, correctional boot camp. Um, thought I wanted to be a probation officer at the time, thought that was a cool job. Hated it, hated it. Um, then I went into protective regulatory services also. I was a facilities investigator for adult protective services. So, yeah, it's kind of in that world and just local, trying to stay here because I like the town and stuff. I could have done other things, but that's what seemed to make sense with my degrees and so forth. Didn't really particularly care about the people, did not care for that, kind of, that line of work. Because I wasn't doing, I, I didn't feel like I was making any progress in anything. So what was the moment that um, maybe a light bulb went off in your head that you were like, I want to do education? Okay. So with the U.S. Border Patrol, I was uh, recruited for the Tucson sector, so up in the mountains of um, south, southern, middle Arizona. Um, Tucson sector was really the... South sector. Anyway, so I, I, I got picked up by the Border Patrol. And so I, I went to train and we were on site and training in Georgia and doing all these things. And after a while, I, I ended up having these two major knee surgeries. And I went back, I was in Georgia. I said we'd gone to Arizona. And I was back in Georgia when this, this problem arised. And I've had these football injuries and I'd, I'd had surgery before. So I was predisposed to the. It's a big, anyway, it was just a, anyway, um, so I came home, oh, they were going to operate on me over there, I said, no, 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 I don't know any of you people, you, none of you, I said, no, 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 I said, because I was in a training mode still, just kind of developing that first year, year and a half, and so, um, first, yeah, and so I said, I called a friend of mine back home, I said, hey, I'm having this problem. He says, don't let them cut on you. Get back home and let the doctor from here that we knew very well, who's just really, really well known in surgery. I think he's retired now in San Antonio, but he says, come let him do it. Come back here if they'll let you. And so I asked the federal government, and the Department of Justice said, well, yeah, you're on injured whatever, FMLA or all that other stuff. <clears throat> and so I came home. And so for a year, I had back-to-back -back surgeries and these really, really extensive surgeries on both knees. Yeah, one was really bad and they had the, because I'd compensated so much on one, I'd hurt them both anyway. So, so I spare you those details, edit forward, fast forward, erase all that. Um, when I was here and the Department of Justice was checking on me, they said, okay, you're, you know, when you finish up your rehab, are you gonna wanna come back? I said, no, I'm not gonna go chase drug dealers and illegals, illegal immigrants, and I say that with a um, total respect for the business, for that line of work and those people and humanity in general. Um, I said, I'm not going to do that. And I said, and I, it, was a, it was a light bulb moment. I had my little apartment here in Corpus, and I said, I'm going to help people go to college. I thought I was going to go to law school. I said, yeah, I'm just going to go to law school. I had a master's degree. And I thought, you don't need a master's degree, but I'll just go to law school and put up my own shingle like all my other friends and be an attorney and have a good life, right? I said, okay, let's do that. Let's get ready. Well, then the Department of Justice had a counselor attached to me because they were. St I'm still on the Department of Justice payroll. Um and they're still paying me. And uh, I called them back, I said, I'm not going back. I said, I'm just, I gotta rehab these knees. I've got, they were very extensive. 
about a year's worth of rehab here and really, really painful stuff. And just, yeah, it just wasn't in the right mind to go back and do that stuff. So to answer your question, there's that light bulb moment that says, I'm not even going to go to law school. I'm going to find a way to get a doctorate so that I can get a doctorate in counseling to help students go to school. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't know what that meant. And what I referred back to those days when I was uh, at Dad's shop, when I got to help other people who knew less than me about how to get into college and, and you know, find that freedom. So then how did you choose UT Austin for your doctorate program? So... I don't know if the opportunities were there. So I started my doctorate at East Texas State, actually. So I found a program through this counseling program, because there were no doctorates here, okay? You wanna talk about how the border initiative impacted us? There was, I was looking around, they are like, Look, to do what you want to do, there's a program at East Texas State specifically for student services counseling, a doctorate in student services counseling. I said, oh, hallelujah. So I thought, I'm on my way. I interviewed the Department of Justice, said, you know what, we'll move you out. We'll pay half your salary for two years. There's this wonderful program. We'll pay half your salary for any job you find for two years to get established. I said, I can do it. And I called them randomly out of the blue. They hired me up there and I actually started my doctoral work there. I went into administration instead of counseling in that doctoral program. But to answer your question again, um, it was a random phone call because I was studying university stuff and I didn't want to. I wanted to be in the community college. I couldn't identify with the university students' plight. You know, those that are just going straight in and this and that, that the, uh, all that other stuff. Even though I lived it there and made assistant dean and so forth at the university. A random interaction walking into a colleague's office and I told her this. I said, you know, I'm going to do community college. I, I'm not going to do university stuff. I can't identify with these, this whole system. It's not, my heart's at the community college. She goes, you know what, I have a friend at the University of Texas. He's a doctoral student down there. He needs to hear from you. I said, no, 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 please don't, don't do that. She said, no, sit down. You're going to do that. I love you, Gwen. Gwen Smith Robinson, still a dear friend of mine to this day. She said, sit down. I said, yes, ma'am. She was our director of multicultural services. And I sat down with her. She goes, she calls up this, this man in Brownsville who was already working on his internship. Long story short, that phone call led to an acceptance at the University of Texas five months, six months later. No. Four or five months later, and I left, and I was on my way, finally. What was your experience like at UT versus going to um, Corpus Christi State? Did you notice that, you know, the college was more funded or that it had more resources? Or was it <laughs> I was blessed. Um, so at the College of Ed, the Community College Leadership Program, the program was the number one program in, its, in the nation for many years. Um, why they shut it down is politics, and I still resent uh, the administration at the University of Texas for doing that. And I'll say that publicly, and I've said it to them, and I will say it to them if they will. Uh, granted, it's a different administration. They closed down the CCLP. <clears throat> I resent that much. Um, but when I was there, it was a cohort. It's 13 people from around the nation that year. We wore a coat and tie. It was business. It was like going to graduate schools at the McComb School or anything else. It was it was all about preparing presidents, people to be presidents of community colleges. That's what it was for. And um, I, uh, it was incredible. We got to go all over the country. We were funded by um, foundations all over the country. We traveled to Canada, all through community colleges all throughout the U.S. And we reported on it back home and did formal visitation reports and so forth when we got home. And it was an incredible experience. Um, John Roosh, who is the ultimate guru of community colleges anywhere on the planet, still lives in Austin, uh, the Roosh Graduate School. Um, 
was is my dear friend and mentor, and he took me under his wing. He and Bill Moore, may you rest in peace. Don Phelps, may you rest in peace, were my, were my mentors. They were the pillars of community colleges in the country and went through things back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s before, you know, and those were my professors. Absolutely world-class opportunity that I don't know, I don't think will ever exist again. And this sounds like an amazing program. Why, would, why do you think that they shut it down? Politics. It was very prosperous. The dean at the time resented it. They got conflicted. Presidents always have to support their deans and so forth. And it was an absolute um, disaster for them to take that program apart. I mean, it was funded by the A.M. Aikens Foundation. I mean, the chairs, the, the chairs' positions, the chairman's positions, the, the endowed teaching positions were endowed with millions and millions of dollars. And it, that's why it, was, it, 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 it came apart because of politics and money, like a lot of things do. And that happened about seven years ago. And I've resented the University of Texas for that since. And I still do. But so be it. I still think? support the football and baseball team. So. <laughs> what do you think? My kids will still go to the University of Texas. But I resent that administration for that decision forever and ever. They, that was the biggest mistake. They took the national guru, the, the world's guru, they took it and unseated him their program, took the money, dis disbanded it. Victor Sines is there now in the College of Ed. He's a dear friend of mine. Victor will do well. Victor will come up and do other things in the executive leadership. I love Victor. I love his program. But I resent the University of Texas for d disbanding that program. Yeah, what, what do you think it would be like today if it was if it still continuing? Do you think that many people would be interested? The timing still? wouldn't have been better. Um, they're producing, it had more women and minority presidents. It had more presidents than all the other colleges, all the other universities, Columbia, yeah, I mean all the other programs. I'm talking all the bigs combined. Had more presidents there. Still does. It's, it's, you can see my body language right now. Um, I'm not, I don't have my horns up right now. Uh, even though I love the University of Texas. I just don't, I resent that, that, that move right there very much. Because all that I went through to find, and here I was part of 13, of a cohort of 13 people, and I had um, a world-class opportunity from a kid from here to the stuff that I described, and I finally had a world-class university opportunity, and I supported it, and I lived it and breathed it and everything else, and then they took it apart. I was like, oh my goodness, what are you doing? Sounds like you had, a, you had good luck getting to go through that program. Yeah, it's very fortunate. Um, timing being everything, got to go through. I'm still got all those relationships across the nation. Certainly, John Roosh and I remain very close. Um, and he has, um, and I'm able to see him still in Austin and so forth. But uh, so after you graduated from that program, then you got into education. You said you were in Chicago. So immediately I was in Fort Worth. Yeah, I was the intern to the chancellor up there, and I stayed there for about three and a half years, four years. And so I was at, in Fort Worth doing great, doing fine, everything was good. And, uh, and I got married, and first baby came, and my son was born in Fort Worth, and then he was five months old, and we moved up to Chicago. And I got an opportunity to, be, to get my first executive position as a vice president there. And, uh, um, yeah, so I did, you know, learned how the unions operate in Chicago. Not my cup of tea, but glad to have had that experience. So, yeah, ended up in, in Cicero, Illinois proper. I mean, downtown. There's a city colleges of Chicago. This was a standalone little island of a little community college out in Al Capone's old neighborhood, literally. Yeah. And then you came back to Texas, to Tyler? Came back to Texas. Uh, was provost and came back to Texas and had a great experience there. Tyler Jenkins is an exceptional, exceptional institution. Looks like a little university. 
band, football teams, drill teams, the Apache Bells, you know, it's world famous and all that other stuff. So really, really fine experience. Had our second kid there, little Lucas. And, um, but I've been back here for 10 and a half years. So after Tyler, um, where did you go? Here, Delmar College. Delmar College. Yes, in 2008. Um, still in my late 30s and here I was, got my first presidency and I was like, oh my goodness. How did that feel coming back to, you know, your roots, like where you're from, things are the place that you started. How, what did you want to get done, you know? Well, I watched it from afar. This was a uh, unstable institution. I mean, they, they had nine presidencies, including, including the interims, in 10 years before I got here. It was just, it was crazy. Okay. They'll, everybody will say it. And, it was, and I, I said no when they initially asked me if I was interested in interviewing. And uh, after a failed search, they came back and called me six months later and said, hey, would you still be interested? I said, what are the odds? There's, and they said, well, there's only two other candidates. I said, okay, I'll take 30% odds. Uh, I'm not a gambler, but I'm not dumb either. And so I said, yeah, let me just see what's going on. And I knew that if I got it, the only way administration, the college was doing great. The students were doing fine. The faculty were solid completely. They've always been, they always will be. Administration was a disaster. I said, if all I can do is go up. All I can do is go home, behave, and stuff's going to go up. Even if I, I, all I have to, anyway, lots of uh, colorful stories, shall we say. And I kept reading about it in the press, and people told me, don't go home, don't, that, don't go to that place. That's a career ender, it's a buzzsaw, it's a hornet's nest, it's a snake pit. I mean, all those nice people were calling me from all over the country. Don't do it, don't do it. I said, it's home. I said, I have to do it. And they said, no, no, don't do it. You're, you're just starting your career. You're going to get a blemish. You're going you're gonna to get burned. It's going to put you back. And I said, then it wasn't meant to be. This world isn't meant to be. Then I'll go back to Dad's muffler shop or something if, if that was what it was meant to be. I don't know. So I jumped in. And uh, yeah, it was tough. It was really, really, really tough. People ask me the other day on a regular basis, would you, knowing what you know now, would you come back? I'm like, hell no, I'm not crazy. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I would have come back. I would come back. It's taken its toll, man. It's really tough. Really, really, really tough. Um, you don't overcome the better part of a decade of instability. I mean, like total instability. I mean, when you start thinking about all the things you have to do, just, it's really, really difficult. So as far as the, the context with the South Texas Border Initiative, was Delmar, by the time you got back there, um, and when you went to school there, do you think that they were receiving more adequate funding, more equal you, funding? You, you, your question is, was the question I was going to bring up. No, it wasn't included. There were no community colleges included without the, with, with, with the exception of South Texas College, and that was just kind of a spinoff of some other politics. The South Texas Border Initiative, this is my big peep with all this. This is why I'm a community college guy, because I watched all that. It was for the universities. It wasn't for the community colleges. And, and where do more students go? Where do more Latino students go? And where do more first-generation students go? To community colleges. And so, with the exception of the spinoff of South Texas College down in McAllen, we weren't, community colleges were not getting funding increases. In fact, state funding kept going down, continues to go down. It's, I think we're changing that finally. But so no, the universities were getting all these programs, the universities were getting all these fundings, and then they were telling everybody, and rightly so, you're not getting extra funding from the state because you're locally taxed. Well, that's to support the operations of the college. That's, I mean, yeah, it's to support the facilities and the growth and the maintenance and operations and so forth. Yeah, some instruction and so forth. It, they made, they, they left, they left us almost entirely out of that equation. Go and read all the documents, go check all the documents, and I'm talking to the people in the camera. Go look at the documents. How many community colleges were in, in, at the table? One, maybe? There's more than that in South Texas, from San Antonio South, because this includes San Antonio. Was there any kind of funding or? Not that I know, no. 
I, I mean, I can look back, and I've, I've looked back at Del Mar. I'm like, no. Everything was locally driven from the tax base because we're, we're a special district. We're not a school district. We're not a university. Mm -hmm. We're a special district. Mm -hmm. And we work off of you know, state funding, appropriations, taxes, and student revenue. The revenues, and this is what I'm going to add right here. So in my personal response to the South Texas Border Initiative, we've passed two bonds since I've been here at the college. And we have $296 million in construction, including a new campus that I was telling you about, going on. That's our response. The South Texas Border Initiative came and went. Never touched the college. The college did this much in bonding before I got here, and it was certainly after. We had to go generate our own. The community had to come together on its own. It had nothing to do with this initiative and the Maldef lawsuit, even though the people that were on that lawsuit were from Corpus Christi. I know them personally, and I know who they are. Why do you think they didn't consider community college? So, I think largely because we're quiet, we're, we, don't, we don't promote ourselves as a whole. Certainly didn't at that time in our history. Um, the universities, the advancement of the universities, and, and they were looking for doctoral programs. They were looking for advanced programs. And, and I, can, I can see it from both sides. I told you my story of being that student, and I had to leave to go get a, a doctoral experience for me because there was nothing locally. Um, community colleges were left out. And so, you know, I, I apologize to no one um, who talks about the, the aggressive growth and generation of funds and so forth for our college to this day. And 296 million for a college our size. Anybody would be proud to have that, any university included. We had to generate, generate it locally. We had to fix what we had here, our infrastructure, because a lot of buildings came, too, from those dollars. A lot of attention came. When attention and resources come, it comes in the way of programs and facilities. You must have facilities to, to house programs. So they came together, right? So we saw what was going on here at my other beloved university here at AMCC and so forth. I saw the, the onset. I remember being in class and uh, at the graduate school, at the, in my graduate program at UT, and Wilhelmina Delco, uh, longtime state representative Wilhelmina Delco, coming to our class. She was a regular um, uh, lecturer. Uh, she and her husband, Exalton, would come on a regular basis, and they would talk about the South Texas Initiative. And so, in San Antonio, I mean, that's where uh, A&M San Antonio started. Okay, a whole new university, a whole new university. Kingsville was growing. They got the programs. Corpus started growing, got the programs. Um, UTRGV, ultimately what is UTRGV, and uh, UT Brownsville, and so forth, Sol Ross, so forth. You saw the universities getting all this play, all this attention, and I'm sitting there as a community college guy, just sitting there saying, geez, guys, how did we miss this? What should the uh, South Texas, what should the South Texas initiative have done for community college? What do you think the, the, the South Texas initiative, South Texas Border Initiative should have done, should have included for community college? Um, legislation to change the trend of the downward support from the state. Just from the appropriations there, we, we, we do, I do recognize, and I dare say we do, community colleges recognize that we have the local advantage from taxing authority if it passes from the voters and all that kind of stuff. But from the, there's three legs of the funding stool. Okay, it's funding, it's support, okay. And had that just been considered, you know, three decades ago at the state level, this downward trend that still continues could have been leveled off, okay? In the 80s, 60, early 80s, okay, early to mid 80s, 65% of community colleges funding came from the state. Today it's less than 20. It's just been this. And so had, had the South, had we been included had we been at the table, a leveling of that, if nothing else, just level, just not this, you know, percentage-wise. Um, and, and, and 
of course, support, acknowledgement um, of other community colleges. There's 50 across the state of Texas, and of course, I'm still just talking about South Texas. But when you think about what our infrastructure was 30 years ago, I mean, 30 years ago, South Texas College didn't even exist, and we get that. And that was a spinoff of TSI, TSTI, Texas State Technical College, and so forth. And they've done wonderful, they're a wonderful institution. Um, but one college? Everybody else is just kind of out on their own? The presidents back then weren't together. There's a lot of, I mean, you've got to go and, th th I think that's a lot of, uh, speaks a lot to the leadership back then. I'll say it, I'll say it. I'm pretty aggressive when I go to Austin. I'm pretty, no, I'm not aggressive, I'm just very clear. Well, speaking yeah. of Austin, how do you think that the Texas legislature, well, views both South Texas and its educational needs, and then also, how do you think they view community college needs? Watch your hand okay. on the mic. Okay, sorry, sorry, it's not to cover, sorry. Uh, so, I've been a president, and this is my sixth legislative session to be part of. I'm, I'm now an, uh, an officer of the association, and I'm not here really to speak on behalf, but I can speak of my experiences. Um, I think for the first time, well, let's just say last session, it, we, we, there was a change in leadership at the association. We're on the board of directors. I'm an officer now. Um, for the first time, I think really we're at the table. Um, I think there's still a lot, still several more sessions to go before we really get to the, you know, um, to the real uh, level of support. Uh, I think right now there's an appreciation, there's a respect um, for community colleges. And for the first time in six legislative sessions, I hear elected officials talking about their experiences as community college um, students, being community college students, and, pri and the pride in their local community colleges. Um, Speaker Bonin will talk about his home college on a regular basis. You know, our chair of Senate higher ed, uh, Senator Creighton, I just spoke with him the other day. He talked about being a pipe fitter, talked about being a student at Tom Ball College and a uh, Austin Community College. There's pride, there's respect. For the first time in six sessions, we weren't even at the table before. And so I think we're on our way. I see a definite positive, uh, different, different, definitely a different experience. That's really good. Yes. Do you, uh, what do you, I guess then yeah, so what do you think about South Texas? Do you think that it's still at a disadvantage? Or no, um, I think right now we are positioned, um, here's how it's been described for me from my um, affiliations and or interactions with leadership, people in leadership at the state. The Houston economies, speaking from an economic standpoint, Austin continues to saturate its economic development. Dallas continues to saturate. Those are not my words. Those are the words of some leaders. San Antonio continues to saturate. If you, Houston is almost saturated in the way of development with Petrochem. Corpus is now, Corpus Christi, this region, because of our port being the first the largest port in the nation for or number one or two, might be number two now, for petrochem exports, number four by tonnage. We have billions and billions of investment coming, like $80 billion of investment coming, new companies coming in, 10 billions, 14 billions, 20 billion, I mean, it's crazy. We are now positioned here at the Port of Corpus Christi to receive all that oil, pipelines and so forth, all that investment comes. And that stimulates all the growth and the need for all kinds of training. I'm not just saying process technologists or welders, it's, it's for all. To answer your question, we are best positioned. Um, we're kind of the focal point for economic development, for new economic development for the state. And what'll be after that will be the Port of Brownsville after that. And so this region, Excuse me. This region will have the uh, opportunities to 
um, to benefit from that. And that means all sectors of the community and society here. Reflecting back on your career, what's your most proudest moment? What's your proudest moment of your work in higher education? Um, the work that's been done to catch us up from what didn't um, come from the border initiative. We had to do it ourselves. We had to get together. I do. Uh, if I can go back, if I can step outside my role and kind of look at myself, I would say, um, local guy comes in, local guy from the west side comes back home, take the takes the helm and catches up from decades of change that didn't take place, and put it into ten years so far. Put it into a ten year capsule of change to change that infrastructure. Because you can only have new programs, you can only have whatever, until you, you have to have a roof over your head. That's one of my proudest moments. Um, certainly coming home and being with my family and so forth, and with my dad as he passed. Literally being with him and so forth. And I was, it was really meant to be. That, those kinds of things. Raising my kids here locally. Um, raising my two boys, my wife and I, with, uh, um, with the things that I loved about this area. Hopefully they'll want to stick around or at least come back and visit dad one day. That kind of thing. That's why I bought him a boat. Um, so what's your biggest goal, biggest goal yet to tackle at Del Mar? Um, improving our student outcomes. We're very good, we're exceptionally good at producing graduates um, based on the model that we currently have. We're a commuter college, part-time. My, my goal is to convert and have more full-time students than part-time because it's the other way around. Because when we do that, we will have systems set up to uh, make more efficient their experience, make their, their experience more efficient, therefore graduate more quickly. Um, I'm hoping to change that whole model um, here in the next few years. And then um, you were telling us a story earlier about signing your own diploma. Yes. So, you <laughs> so we have some real sneaky people in our, in our, on my executive team, and I mean that in a good way. And um, in 2010, you know, I kept telling everybody there. They're like, "Are you a graduate?" They'd ask me, "Are you a graduate? Did you graduate? Uh, you graduated from Delmar College?" There was an assumption. I said, "Nope. I got 60 hours, and I that's all I needed to go to the university. I didn't need it." Um, I thought. They said, "Well, wouldn't it be neat if you're a graduate?" I'm like, "Ah, that was 100 years ago. I don't need it anymore. It's okay." And in my paper forms, my stacks of signatures, it was just another thing, something with the university, moved it on, signing my stuff, didn't read it. And what it was is I was signing my own um, permission form for them to reverse transfer a credit, to three hours of credit, so that I can give an associate's degree. And so they did all that, framed a diploma that I actually signed, not, you know, it's not physically. There's too many of them. And at the spring graduation of 2010, I think, 2011, 2010, um, I was sitting here doing all this stuff on stage at my own graduation, and they snuck up on me and presented me with, oh, and by the way, you're a graduate today, too. And so I graduated in 2010 from Delmar College after starting in 1987. Right, so. Yeah, um, it's pretty cool. It's on my wall. It's right next to my University of Texas. And, Diploma. My a and programs, my CCSU stuff is at home. Um, oh, and then you said you had a, start, a story about the one time you borrowed money for school. Yeah. Um, so in that big oil bust, 
of the late 80s. Uh, I never borrowed money because we, we didn't have to. Okay. And I was living, that was, that was my pay, was scholarship or tuition, books, and living expenses, live at home, work. And uh, there was a time where my dad told me going into the latter part of my junior year into my senior year, I just needed, I was about to cross the goal line. And my dad said, there's no more money. Everything you make, you get to eat, you get to live here, you better figure it out. So I gave, so I went and I applied for student loan. I think it was, it was very inexpensive to come to school here. I actually earned my bachelor's, my master's degree for $3,000. I actually, that's how much it cost me to go to school here, or a full master's degree. Yeah, that's two classes now. Um, so, I borrowed $2,000, $3,000, and I uh, got enough to get in school, buy my books, get into the semester, and I was on my way to finishing my, and then I had, I had $1,200 to live off of. And uh, I remember when my dad asked me for the money, he says, I need it, because Uncle Sam is taking it all. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's when he's selling off the business and paying penalties and all kinds of stuff. I remember giving him my financial aid money, giving it back to the guy, Uncle Sam, that lent it to me to begin with. So he made double on that. Way to go, Uncle Sam. Um, so I gave it back to him and uh, gave it to my dad. And I, was, I remember being absolutely, I wouldn't say hopeless, but as close to hopeless as I ever felt. So I was like, Good Lord, how, how am I going to get, what am I going to do? I'm like, I'm working for nothing. My family's working for nothing. We're running this business and we get zero. Other than, okay, we get to live. And I said, okay. That moment, I, I look back like I did on my second grade year. I look back in retrospect and evaluate those, and analyze those things, and see that as, a, as an epiphany moment, moment of enlightenment. And it, that moment taught me to hang on to hope and dreams. And um, that's why I believe, you know, with the community college, everything we do, even our tagline is dreams delivered. Um, used to be what's your dreams before that. I, I totally subscribe to that. Totally uh, in, uh, buy into that notion of motivating communities, segments of our students, and our, all of our students, our employees, to, to dream. Because I remember that one moment. Man, that was a pretty lonely moment. That was a pretty... I remember coming to class. And, I mean, I had a needle in my gas. It was always on empty. But that was it. I mean, I was like, God, I don't even know how I'm going to put gas in my vehicle to come to school anymore. I don't know how I'm going to... I guess I can go home and eat. I was like, yeah, I'm not so sure there's going to be anybody at home. I mean, I, I didn't know what was going on. It was kind of a fairly traumatic... Uh, experience, you know, relatively, you see your parents going into bankruptcy and that kind of stuff. It's horrible. It's horrible. But I didn't leave. I stayed with them and help them, help them dig out. And we dug out. We dug out. But, uh, so, you know, the students borrow money and do things. I take it very personally and those kinds of things. So I use that for, as a basis to lead those personal experiences in addition to my training and education. Right, and then I guess, any advice that you have for future generations working for uh, equity and education, people advocating for Latinos in education? Yeah, well, for all students, I would say. Um, I've always been, you know, I wrote my dissertation on first-generation students, African-American, Anglo, and Hispanics. I looked at them all. Um, I would say, remember the little guy, little gal, to use the... Term. Always remember, no history says to know your direction in the future as it relates to the past. Know about this initiative that took place that strengthened the southern part of Texas. Um, know how it relates to where your institution's going, uh, if at all. It does. Know how it work, how they work together, and if it doesn't. 
um, make something happen. I think that's what I did. Okay. All right. I think we're good. Good. Awesome. Thank you so, so much.